Uh, two quick things, one quick thing. This Sunday, if, you, if we're going to have our recollecting meeting on going to Israel in February, so if you've been stirred in, to go to, with us to Israel, it's the time to bring in your registration uh, your, and $500 deposit, and Mac and Kathy, I don't see them here, but uh, they'll be here Sunday. It'll be at 1245, give or take a few minutes, in room four after Sunday service. And there's one other thing that came to me, but disappeared. Turn with me to Luke. No, let's just, let's just jump to John. We're going to go through the Gospel of John tonight. We, we finished about this idea of listening to the voice of God because that's what builds friendship, is the ability to hear. You're not sitting in wet clothes, are you, Dwayne? Dear God, somebody... All right, well, get... get... Oh, okay, well, don't mess up the chair. It's fine, as long as you... <laughs> All right, don't put the air on too much tonight. Just keep that section nice and warm. Yeah, oh, a shot. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love when God releases something. It's that trigger moment. John chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 14. <clears throat> I want to talk about how we hear the voice of God in his word, how we experience God inside his word, how we can have the word of God have its influence on us. And I want to say right from, you'll see it in the middle in the scripture, is that the entire purpose of the Bible from the Genesis to, to Revelation 21, 22, 21, is to bring you to Jesus. That is the entire purpose of Scripture. And if Scripture, if what you do does not bring you to Jesus, then you might be going on a little loopy loop that isn't worth going on. So there's a reason for that a lot of times that we go on those loopy loops. I know I did for many years. Is that the Bible, you know, you might have heard this before. It's like, a, it's like your owner's manual. It's like an instruction book. You know, I don't know about you, but as a dad and five kids... The one thing I dreaded more than anything was getting, buying one of the kids a toy that I had to assemble. And you know how they are. They're built in China, and they're brought in these little pieces of paper that sometimes is Chinese, sometimes it's just numbers, pictures, and you're just staring at this thing. Okay, I do this, and i got to find this, this, that, and i got to put these together, and then I go to step two and step three. And although in some ways... It's a lot like that when you're learning the Bible. It's foreign. When I, I got saved in 19, when I was 19, I didn't know what an Ephesian was. Somebody said, turn to the book of Ephesians. And I thought, why in the world would an Ephesian be? I've never heard of an Ephesian. It's a kind of fish. You know, and I had, so I had to learn language. I had to learn reference, where things were, what they meant. And... And so a lot of ways, you are learning nuts and bolts and how to put nuts and bolts together and build a bicycle. But over time, if you just learn nuts and bolts and how to put a bike together, you build a lot of bikes. But it doesn't necessarily change you like you'd like to be changed. You, you more get focused on what you have to do in order to be pleasing or to change God. And you almost goes opposite. And from what was once an ex exciting experiment becomes kind of... Uh, struggle, condemnation, I can't do enough, I'm never going to get out of this, it's just I don't understand it. And that's when you really have to learn to make the switch. And that, should, that begins almost immediately, but sometimes it can become a really intentional shift because we've, we've gotten so, so focused on the doing, the do's and the don'ts. The, 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 uh, to, I always say it's called to observe to do. And I want, to, I want you to think of the, big, the Bible as this tonight. The Bible is something to which you behold Christ so that you can become conformed into his image. It would be more than, instead of that brown box from China, and God bless China, because without China we wouldn't have anything right now. <laughs> yeah. But but I use that because there's so many things that come out of, of China that are, you know, and anyway, so and instead of that brown box and you're thinking you're going to put together this bicycle, somehow a Rembrandt 
is inside. And you pull out this picture framed in beautiful detail and there's really nothing to do with it except to step back and look at it. And the more you look at it, the more you feel the influence of, of the art, of the artist, of, of the colors, of, this, of the scheme, of what the, the subject matter is. And, and the more you are beholding it, you, it, it, it affects you. It's like, how many of you can think of a, sitting and watching a really beautiful sun, sunset? And you're just not in a hurry. You're not driving down the freeway and looking, but you, you're just looking and you just, it's just you have the time to watch it. You watch the colors, you watch the evening. And it's, if you have that impact, it, 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 it touches you. It touches the, uh, who you are and what your day's been like. And it can unravel parts of your day and it can settle you back into peace and it can have a profound effect. The cool thing about a sunset or a beautiful painting like a Rembrandt or something is that you can return to that as many times as you want and re-experience it. Now, here's the beautiful thing about a sunset. They're never the same twice, so you really can't return to the same sunset because it's going to always be changing. But you can return to your memory of the sunset and re-experience the sunset. So you really have an unlimited opportunity to behold if we can uh, slow down enough and, and value enough. And that's what really, it, whenever you read in the New Testament about keeping the word, which we'll read tonight, it means to value or guard from losing it. It's not you know, keeping it locked in a room because it's trying to escape. It's like something that now has become of, of great value that you want to know where it is and you want to be able to to um, enjoy and, and, and uh, guard in your heart. Which, if w when I look at the word that way, that it's to lead me to Jesus, it's not necessarily instructions as it is experience, to experience the word. If I say McDonald's, you had an experience. Someone's like, get behind me, Satan. I don't want to eat that. And someone says, it's not that bad. I actually enjoy McDonald's. You have an opinion. You've had an experience. You've been there. You've ate there. You know what you think about it. So the word carries both an image, an emotion, uh, memories. Uh, some, of, some of us got hungry. And it excites. And Russell got hungry. <laughs> you know? Because that's what words do. And that's the beauty of why God gave us the word. In Genesis, we learn that in the beginning was uh, the earth was without form and without was void and was in chaos, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over this chaos, and then God said, let there be light. So in creation and new cre recreation are three components, chaos, the Spirit of God, and the voice of God speaking. So here's the good news. We provide the chaos. So whatever we're going through, whatever un unraveling of life that we can't pull it back together, that's our part. Holy Spirit loves to brood over that. He, doesn't, he loves to collect himself over our chaos. And then when God speaks from what is darkness, light can shine. So in John 1, 1, and I'm sorry because I did... It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So who are we talking about? Jesus, the living Word. And this is the nativity from John's perspective that the living Word that was with God, that was God, became flesh. And so now go jump up to verse 14. So let's begin to look at the Bible we hold as this glorious person we're getting to know. And the word became flesh. So Jesus, who was living word, spirit, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, 
the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. To dwell among means to tent or camp or reside. So God found a way to be in the midst of us, to dwell with us by coming in a mortal flesh. And we beheld the glory of God by beholding Jesus, and it was full of grace and truth. And that is the most, still to be the most valuable part of glory. If you're beholding God's glory, there's grace and there's truth. And John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This is, was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received in grace for grace. So even in the very first chapter of John, we begin to see that by beholding Jesus, who's dwelling among us, encountering Jesus, there is an experience of grace and then more grace and another grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So all of the New Testament and the New Covenant is just built on the foundation of this grace and truth that came through Jesus. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son of Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him or revealed him. Now, I say this all the time in passing, so now you know where it is. In the Nativity, the first advent, Jesus comes upon the planet, into the planet, as the only begotten Son of God, right? Meaning, if you're only begotten, that means you're the only begotten. There's no more begottens. There's only this begotten. This is a unique, one-of-a-kind God-man, man-God, who is going to go to the cross for all of mankind as a willing sacrifice and take upon himself all of sin, past, present, into the future of all mankind and pay and the wrath of God, the punishment and the condemnation, and in so doing, die, be buried, and then on the third day be raised from the dead. Forty days later, he would ascend forever until he returns to the right hand of God, cleanse the, cleanse the very heavens, and sit down at the right hand of God as the high priest of our confession. And when he was raised from the dead, in, John, in Psalm 2, which quoted now throughout the New Testament, like Acts 13, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 5, Father said, like we, we saw a similitude in the baptism, he said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And so he was born again, brought forth as a new creation a new creation that now is referred to as the firstborn among many brethren. So we are born into the image of the resurrected Christ. So we are, we are what we're learning, if we can see it here and practice this, to learn of Jesus, then we will employ these same skills to behold the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ. And if you can start having an experience with who he is as glorified, that even that changes the whole world. That changes the whole game. It just changes the entire game. So go with me now to John three. Let me say this. This is so elementary, but it's it's worth bearing. When Jesus took left his his uh, he left his privilege of heaven, came as became man. He then, as man, had to walk life in obedience to the Father under His voice and fulfill where Adam failed. So he could not have extra privileges that Adam had because it wouldn't have been an equal substitution. So Jesus, when he was laying in the manger, which we're going to all sing about, and it's a fun and I delight in time, was not looking up into the stars over in Bethlehem and looking at the stars and going, wow, this is incredible. I made that. I made that. I like the way it looks from down here. <laughs> I can't wait to tell. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. We're gonna get more pictures from the earth. No, he's just a baby. He knows how to poop, pee, yeah. cry, eat, suck. And he's given the same skills as any child being born. He has a spirit. He's union with God, but he's going to have to awaken to that he 
who his father is and that he is the son of God and he has a purpose. Which is really important because when we hear Jesus speak, he's not speaking to someone who always just, oh, I always knew I was the son of God because, you know, I just kind of just went into this dinky body and grew up. I'm, you know, there's never been a conflict. No, he had to, by faith, believe. Just like we have to, by faith, believe and have an experience and be willing to add faith to it. So in John 3, John the Baptist is now beginning to uh, acknowledge even more so that Jesus is the one that he's been talking about, and Jesus is now taking on a whole other paradigm of expression of who God is. And he says these incredible words in verse 29, John 3, 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John's saying, I am, he's saying of himself, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. This is now the bridegroom has stepped up, and that's why he's taking over all ministry. He must increase, I must decrease. He who comes, now catch this, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. So Jesus is learning just like you and I are. He's learning, he's listening, he's learning, and in the discovery, he's coming to who he is. He's encountering promise, prophecy, and it's beginning to behold with, with certainty about the time he's hitting his bar mitzvah. And so when he's left in Jerusalem because he gets enamored in the movement of sound and co the conversation in the temple about the law and about the teachings that he forgets and does, gets distracted, does not follow his family into the, into the caravan that's going to make its way back up to Nazareth. And they find him three days later after they've frantically been searching everywhere and Mary is saying to Jesus, uh, how, don't, how could you do this to us? Don't you know we'd be terrified, your father and I? And Jesus says, don't you realize I have to be about my father's business? So Jesus was awakening to he had two fathers, so to speak. He, you know, yes, I'm, I'm going to honor my earthly father, Joseph. I'm going to recognize his role in my life. And Mary calls him dad, and I'm going to call him dad. But no, 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 I'm, I've awakened. And he's inside a conversation. And that's what you, are, you and I are in when we go to the Bible. It's good to be a conversation. It's to be something that's capturing you. And so what he's seeing and hearing, he's testifying. And one of the things that will make Scripture alive is if you converse with God about what you're seeing and hearing. Don't just don't study to try to figure it out in the brain. It's a picture. It's, it's you're, let, you're beholding something beautiful and you're letting it affect you. And it'd be like standing next to, with, you know, at the Getty Museum with a dear friend and you're just chanced upon something that's just really captured your imagination, that's really impressed you. It's humongous, it's large, it's small. And you just start dialoguing what you're seeing. And now you're experiencing together something. Well, that's how we are with God. We are, we are dialoguing with him what we're seeing and hearing and that's becoming our testimony. And that's what's going to give us victory over the devil later. That wonderful moment of seeing and hearing and testifying of what we're seeing and hearing. And that's what meditation is. It's taking the word of God and pondering it and rolling it around in your mind, conversing back and forth until it begins to be something to which you can recount or recollect. But it's having the conversation with God. And no one receives his testimony. So Jesus walked through the earth with an assignment that was growing ever clearer to him and no one getting it. And he who received his testimony, now get this is you and me now, he who has received his testimony has certified, which is a powerful statement. I wrote it on the side of my Bible. It means to send, to stamp with signet or a private mark for security or preservation. So if, when you and I enter into that conversation with God in his word, hearing, seeing, seeing, hearing, and we receive what we understand of who Jesus is, yeah. 
then we are signifying, we are putting our own personal stamp on it that that's ours and we agree with that. And that is where, that's where the Bible starts to now have an influence of change. Uh, for whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. So now we're going to go into a paradox. Jesus is going to talk about words and about his words. And while he's talking, there are no written words of his words except everything up to Malachi. So the Bible was never meant to be something that's static, that it's just, you know, these pages and that's all there is. When, you, when you, the Bible is being read to you by God or when you're hearing the author read out loud, I like to say, you'll, it, it will enlarge the sound of it. You will go to, to, to hear his voice. A lot of times people want to hear the voice of God and they go, I have such a hard time. Just read the Bible out loud. Met, and take a portion of scripture that you're looking at and read it a few times out loud. And just like a, like, like a really great tasting Thanksgiving meal. Now I'm really going to get you hungry. You know, where you get that stuffing once a year, that whatever it is that you just delight in, it brings back memories. And, you're, you know, later the next day, you're glad you only get it once a year. But right now you're tasting it and... That's savoring. That's, that's the way the word of God is. We're, we're being impacted. And when, we're, when that's happening, it's awakening conversations, awakening words. So now go with me to John 5, verse 20, 31. So if you haven't picked this up, you could easily have your own little experience with Jesus and his word by reading to the gospel of John this week or open yourself to consider because it's so much in this book about explaining Jesus in the word. So John uh, 531, Jesus is now talking. He's in a paradox. He has religious people who know the Bible very well. He's talking about who he is. They're having a hard time accepting who he's telling them who he is. And yet he's saying that everything about who he is is in the Bible. So it's possible to get narrow-minded and concrete thinking and hard-hearted where you can't hear the expressiveness of God inside the Bible because you've gotten like, well, you get snagged. And Jesus is trying to help people with, wait a minute, wait a wait. Let me help you. So he says, if I bear witness to myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And he's speaking of uh, Father, not John. You have, sent, you have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, yet I don't receive testimony from man. I don't need John to prove who I am. But I say these things that you may be saved. Now, you're going to learn. When you're having, in the Bible, God is communicating in a conversation where he's trying to get your allegiance. He's trying to get you to agree that he's talking and that he has authority. And it's easy, if you want, you'll always have a reason to dismiss the conversation. You will always have a reason to say, well, that's not God, that couldn't be, he doesn't do that anymore, this and Because he wants it to be a relationship that faith is engaged all the time. Every time I hear God, I have to choose to believe I'm hearing God. It never gets to a place where I hear God that I cannot deny. I mean, I could talk myself out of believing God, and if I work long enough, I could talk myself out of believing I, anything I've ever heard from God because that's the, man, the, the ability of doubt. It begins to take things apart in an argument and breaks it in and to a scientific experiment to a point where it has no power. But on the other hand, every time like we talked about last week about walking in the spirit and then beginning to observe something that catches your attention and going that direction and then begin to be impacted. Every time I take that next step, there's another step. And then there's another step. And if I'm conversing with a testimony of what I see in here, I'm having, it's a process of discovery. And there's no hurry. You may get, get one verse of scripture 
and be there for weeks because it's just unfolding. It's not necessary to get volumes, nor is it you have to try to get something out of every verse you read. A good way to begin reading the Bible is to read, have some place you're reading from and read every day until God talks to you. And until you're ready to start learning of a subject or, or a theme or, or connect some of those, you know, buildings and bikes, just let God speak to you. And it never condemns you and it never uh, makes you feel hopeless or in despair. Never. If you're, if, if you are feeling that, then someone else is reading the Bible to you. And it's not the Holy Spirit. It's the accuser pointing out your faults and look at this and look at that. And if Moses said, if, if a man has committed adultery, then we must stone them. And here we caught somebody in adultery. What do you say? You know, it's just, it's fragmentation. And it'll leave you, it will leave you unsettled. It will leave you feeling bad, you know, without hope, powerless, and that is, once you, if you're in that, put the book down, go take a walk. And say with your mouth, this is not God speaking to me because this is not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I'm not finding any love here. I don't feel joy. I don't feel peace. I don't feel, and, and you're learning to recognize the voice of the good shepherd. Because without the, the, the recognition of the voice of the good shepherd, we'll follow the voice of religion all over the place. And we learn by doing so. So it's not all that bad that we have to get, go off on some bunny trails. Therefore, there is another... Wait, let's see. Um, he was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to, for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness to me that the Father has sent me. So experience with the Bible, whether it's a miracle whether it's a sensation of great peace, uh, an awareness that this is where my answer lay, lies and I need to go and discover it more, is, is part of that which witnesses to the Bible that we're hearing God speak. And if you don't value that, you'll lose that. We had a gentleman in our church this years and years ago, like 20 years ago, and on one service, we're just praying, and I called out, I felt like the Lord was saying, that someone with a bad knee was being healed. And so I called out, and this gentleman was going to surgery that week, like the next day or two, to get a knee replacement. And he went to surgery, went to the doctor, went to the surgery, and he, they said, we don't need to touch your knee. It's totally, perfectly fine. So he was totally, powerfully, completely healed, and so happy. Weeks later, maybe months later, he walks through the lobby of the front, front office, and, and forever, we've just, you know, we'll get magazines from all kinds of people, you know, and we'll just stick them out in case someone has something to do while they're waiting. And it happened to be a Benny Hinn magazine. And this was at the time Benny Hinn was in all kinds of controversy, an evangelist, very flamboyant, but mighty miracles. And, he's, and he had been hearing something about Benny Hinn being something not kosher. So when he sees the magazine on, our, on, a, on a little desk or coffee table, he decides that if we have a Benny Hinn magazine in our church, then we have to be bad like Benny Hinn. And he leaves the church, never comes back. And I thought to myself, you got your, you got your knee fixed. I mean, what, what, more, what bigger witness do you need to know that we're not, not of God? You got a good miracle. You got a good help. But that's the power of doubt and the power of accusation, the power of unbelief. It will, it will make you leave the place that is actually your home. It'll drive you away thinking your father's not good. So he's, he's trying to coach these guys. Uh, and the father himself who sent me has testified of me. And you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, but for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. Think of that. So I can search the scripture. I want to find that healing. I want to find that peace. I want to find the freedom from torment. 
I need prosperity. I want to see an answer to this prayer. And we can do that because in the, we're, this is the word, word of life, the word is living. But if it does not bring me to Jesus, I won't get the thing I'm trying to gain because he's the only one that really is the life. He is the way. He is the truth. So all scripture leads me to an encounter with Jesus, and the encounter with Jesus will be the unfolding of the thing I'm really searching for. So Jesus, now Jesus is trying to help everybody, but they're having a hard time. Let me take you to John 6. I think if you saw, can you imagine being the living word, walking around trying to bring people into an encounter with you? <laughs> you might, <laughs> we think we have a hard time telling our new, get somebody to believe what we believe, but he's actually it. Yeah. And they're stumbling over it all the time. So in John 6, he does a miracle of multiplication of fish and loaves. And that miracle, uh, after the miracle, he leaves the, the location and gets on a boat and goes to another part of the Galilee. And in the morning, everybody gets up and looking for him, and they can't find him, and then someone comes, and they get a report he's on the other side of the lake. So they jump in their boats, and they head off there. And then about chapter, uh, let's see, verse 26, I think, John 6, 26, Jesus meets them, and he says to them, Most assuredly, I say, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. In other words, wow, this is a free lunch. This is a you know, perpetual lunch machine. <laughs> Do not labor for the food that, which perishes. That you can, you know, but for the food which endures for everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father set his seal on him. Well, then they said to him, well, what shall we do? To that we may work the works of God. And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Well, therefore they said to him, Well, what sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? And then they throw this out. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, since we're talking about food. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, I want to only show you this. It's your worth, your meditation. I can't do this work for you, but it, it's all in this chapter. When the Lord is bringing us to discover something about him, he's conversing with us from the point we are currently living at. And he'll start a conversation, woman at the wall, he'll talk about water. Here the people are trying to get food. He wants them to get everlasting food. So he'll talk about laboring for the food. Now, you and I can throw these little zingers out to God, you know, like, you know, riddle me this, or what about that, or how about this? And if you do, God will zinger you back, and he, will, he, will, he won't answer your real question. He will, he will actually frustrate you because he's really not interested in proving himself. He's God. He has no need to prove to anybody that he's God. It's a gift to learn him. He's not, a, he's not hard up for worship. He's like, yeah, i got to get more in the choir. He is free. So when that argument starts, stop. Because you will get yourself so deep in theology that you will be stuck. So they're, they're going, well, what about this? And he's going, well, that bread really didn't come from Moses. It came from my father. Now I'm that bread. And then they're going, you're the bread. What do you mean you're the bread? And it just gets really nasty because he basically gets to the point saying, you're going to have to eat my body and drink my blood. Now, we understand that to be symbolic. We understand it to be communion. We understand it to be the covenant. But they're just going, you see, they're getting stuck on a literal argument. Don't get literal with God. Don't get, force him into the natural when he is not bound to the natural. Let the natural unfold who he is, but don't force him into the natural. Now get inside this box, and if you can fit in there correctly, then I'll believe you. He will not go into the box for you. Now he got out of the box once, all right? He's not going back in the box. It's done with the box. So he continues this conversation till in verse um, uh, 60. Here's what happens. It says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, 
all of this, and it's a bigger conversation than I got to share with you. This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he says, does this offend you? I tell you, Jesus, I think, delights in these kind of conversations. It's like, oh, what if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? You know, I'm really challenging their finite thinking. What if you just see me go up into heaven, come back? I don't think you can do that. Well, who says you can't do that? You know, I mean, and the Spirit, it's just, now listen, it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Inside of the living word, when it's spoken, when it comes alive, is spirit and life. And there are some of you who don't believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who would not believe and who would betray him. And then they said, then he said, therefore I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So they got offended at this conversation that they forced God into. And in the conversation, they ended up leaving justified that the, he was a lunatic. And that will happen to us. We can talk or we can get ourselves in this kind of thing. I'm never going to that. I went the, and then Jesus looks around. He's, he's had about 5,000 people. Now he's down to 12. Do you guys also want to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Meaning, we were thinking about it, but we made a quick list and, you know, where else are we? You have the words of eternal life. I want you to hear this because we're running out of time. The, the relationship of maturing salvation, discipleship, sonship is in the words being heard. And they now value the words of eternal life that Jesus carried more than anything else. Because they go on to say, we've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They didn't say, you're the Son of God, we can't leave you. They said, no, you've got words of life. Whenever you talk, I come alive. That's how, the, that's how it's meant to be whenever we approach him, is to have a conversation where we come alive. An everlasting life, I come alive when you talk. I come alive. And so he said, did I not choose you? So uh, John 8, real quick. Let me see. I'm going to run out of time, but we've got another week. John 8, and then we'll do one more verse and we'll be done. John 8, 31. Jesus said to the, those disciples, who believed in him. He has a whole new bunch of people following him right now. <laughs> if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So if you let the word of God abide, live, and be a part in you, if you abide in my word, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him. He got offended. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll make me free? Which is stupid, right? They're, 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 they're stuck under Roman rule. They're under bondage to everybody. But in their pride and in their mindset, they're holding themselves still like they're, David's their king. And Israel's a great nation. They're, they're, and all that did was happen is that he triggered something. You ever want to get somebody mad? Just, in, just insinuate that there's freedom that they're yet to taste. I'm as free as I need to be. Because we just, it, it's challenging to have truth. And because we all we know about truth, quote unquote, is people exposing our nakedness or our weakness or our, or our lack of ability. So we've learned real quickly from kindergarten on, no, I'm okay. I've got it together. Talk, I don't want to hear anything about what you have to say. Except God is totally different because when he talks to us, we begin to see things. We see truth. And truth is liberating. It's freeing. It, it's, it's delightful. It picks you up. It carries you. It builds. It strengthens you. And there's not any condemnation and there's no accusation. It's just liber liberation. The door opens. You don't have to stay in the cell anymore. You're not that person. You don't have to think that way of yourself. 
This is who I am. This is my opinion towards you. And it just carries you out of the place you've been put stuck. But they couldn't hear that because they heard it in a, again in a physical. And they get in another argument. If, after you finish John 6, read John 8. It's even a m more famous argument. I mean, they get to the point they're going to stone him. Stone him. Because truth, when you confront truth, you argue with truth, and you challenge truth, and then you try to... It will, it will get you so upset that you can, before you know it, be, be outside of yourself. Last, last verse. John 14, 21. I'm going to take you to my, la my first scripture I ever learned. And I will close with this. One verse. I'm 19 years old. I've never been, never been to church in my life. Never picked up a Bible. Oh, I, maybe a little bit before. But. And now I'm saved. I've moved into a discipleship house in Thousand Oaks. And we're, going, we're given scriptures, a scripture a day to memorize. And this is the first scripture I ever got given. And it had to be sovereign in the, because it's just a profound scripture. It says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So now let me sh share with you the simplest way to begin to let something given to you to learn or something pointed out to you that you ought to learn, how it can come and find an access, even if you don't know the Bible. I never heard the Bible. So you, you, you begin by accepting what's being said. That's red letters, so it's Jesus talking. Jesus is saying, he who has my commandments and keeps them. Uh, I've learned, sometimes you've got to learn what's the word mean. You can go to a concordance. This word keep is so powerful because it means to guard, to value, to, to protect. So when I hear you say, or when you give me something and I keep it, that's showing to you that I love you. So how do I say I love you, God? I bring and hold and value your word. I may not be able to do it, but I value it. I see it as for what it is, and I value that. And when I do that, my love triggers a love response from God, the Father, and a love response from Jesus. That's why whenever you will make a, a movement of, I believe, I accept, I receive, that is God speaking. That is truth. You will feel the, the warmth, the, 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 the delight, the encouragement. Yeah, that's it, boy. That's it. That's me talking. That's a good, yeah, yeah. And when you have that experience, the next thing will be I'll manifest myself to him, which means I'm going to show you something more. So I was just this little guy, 19, learning that if I could hold the thing I was given, then I that would show love and bring love and would open the door for something new to be given. So then if I could hold the new thing that was given, that would release love and receive love and open the door for something new to be given. And then later, years later, a really great teacher said to me, or to a crowd of people I was in, said, if you ever wonder what happened or where are you or how have you got disconnected? Go back to the last thing God said to you and restart there. Pick it back up. Value it and keep it because it will begin the conversation again. All right? Husbands, wives, is that not true? If you get in an argument, you're just going to get up the next morning and just blow it off? Now you can probably start up again where you were and try to process this because there's something here that needs to come to revelation or understanding. And it's the same thing with Scripture. So let's stand up. It's 8.34. I want to get you out of here. I want to uh, release whatever grace God's given me to, to learn his word and have experience with him in his word. I'd like to give that away. Freely I've received, I want to freely give it. 
So I want to release it as a blessing to you tonight. And if you can, if that sounds like, wow, that, that's true, it could be done, then receive it. And tomorrow or tonight when you go to the Word, expect God to um, cause the Scripture to come back alive in a fresh new way, to hear His voice in the Scripture. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, just, just pre- Put yourself in a position to receive. In the name of Jesus, I now release the grace that you've given me to learn you, to experience you, to know you. I give this grace to each and everyone here and online and anyone listening later or watching. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. That everyone here's eyes would open, the eyes of their understanding would open to see and to behold what is the fullness of whatever you're trying to communicate in who you are, who we are, what you've called us to be, and the power that's available to us. In the name of Jesus, I declare that as the next time we go to the scripture, that it will become a conversation where we will see and hear and then talk to you and hear you talk back to us. I lift off now all condemnation that the Bible has ever put on you from messages you've heard in the past to experiences of failure and shortcoming to being dragged out into public shame and humiliation and scripture used against you. I declare that it now lifts off of you and you would even know that as Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. So that all condemnation could fall off, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And Father, I pray now in place where we have been stuck or disconnected or not aware of where we are, that you would bring us back to that place where the conversation fell off, where we, where we neglected it, hit an obstacle, trauma, and you would begin the conversation again. Holy Spirit, bring to our remembrance everything we've ever heard or Jesus ever said or ever wanted to communicate. Bring it back alive in Jesus' name. And one last thing. Now, Lord, I pray that for us as disciples of yours who have wandered, who have gone through experiences that have left us uh, traumatized, brutalized, shut down, don't know where to go and how to go on. I ask that you would come along our side like you did to the, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and you would begin the conversation with us in our pain and in our place of confusion. You would allow us to tell you our story of how things have turned out. And then you would begin to reinterpret for us our story in light of what you're planning to do. And that our hearts would come alive as you spoke. And then our eyes would open as you broke bread. And we would know that we have encountered Jesus. Now lastly, Father, in the name of Jesus, it is my prayer that every one of us whenever we go to scripture or worship or prayer, that we would encounter Jesus Christ. That we would not encounter just techniques and not learn and learn how to make bigger bikes, but we would meet our lover of our soul, our savior, our deliverer, our redeemer, our king. In the name of Jesus, we wanna do that now. Open our eyes to see you, Jesus. Open our ears to hear you, Jesus. Open our heart to understand you, Jesus, and bring us into that encounter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you online.